Excellent. So I, uh, for better or worse, I have a face mic so I can wander around, which is not good for me because I tend to do that. Um, so apologies in advance. Um, thanks again to the organizers for uh, this great event and for inviting me to come. I, I've learned a lot. Uh, it's, it's been wonderful. Um, so Max and Tamar are very, very hard acts to follow. Um, so I'm sort of the cleanup guy here. Um, I am a microeconomist, but uh, am going to try for the next 30 minutes to play as a macroeconomist. Uh, and so you can think of this as taking some of the methods that, that Tama just showed you and some of the machinery and applying them to more aggregate data to try to make causal statements about the relationship between past variation and climate and aggregate outcomes, and then to heroically take that information, project forward, and think about what future damages might be, guided by an understanding, again, about how these aggregates have responded to changes in climate uh, in the recent past. Um, so Max and Tama, I'm going to spill this water, did a great job of, of, of setting up so I can move quickly through my uh, early slides here. Here is the obligatory IAM damage function plot. Uh, I reversed the sign on the y-axis, so Tama showed something like this. Uh, these are damages uh, in three different damage functions from the three uh, leading integrated assessment models. Uh, in the, the first interagency working group that Max showed, these were actually used to uh, estimate the social cost of carbon. Um, and if you look at these, and, and here I really want to call your attention to the magnitudes here. So a business as usual uh, scenario right now, we think our, our best estimate is around three degrees Celsius of warming by 2100. Uh, and so if you, uh, I'll walk over since I have this. Uh, so if you go to three degrees Celsius warming and just read off the plots here, so Nordhaus says we're gonna lose about 2% of GDP. Uh, Toll says we're gonna lose about 0%, right? So no impacts out to three degrees Celsius warming, which is our best estimate of where we're headed right now given emissions trajectories and policy commitments. Okay, so minimal damages below two to three degrees Celsius, uh, and then perhaps accelerating after that uh, more for dice uh, than for fun. Um, this point has been made. Uh, again, let's just sit with those estimates for a little bit. So consider a 2% effect on GDP. So an economy growing at 1% a year by 2100 will be something like 170% richer. Most economies are growing faster than that, so they will be comparably richer. But let's say an economy is growing only at 1% a year in real terms, um, be a lot richer in 100 years, right? So with climate change, it's going to knock 2% off that, so it will only be, you know, 165, 166% richer, right? So instead of 170% richer, we'll be just a little bit less than that uh, 80 years from now. Um, so, so why are we worried, right? Why is this a big deal? Climate change, why are we having this conference if, if these are the, the main effects? Um, I think if you, as, as you've just seen, uh, as Max set up nicely, as Tama showed us uh, new evidence, um, not everyone is necessarily on board with the, I would say, much older science that went into estimating these original damage functions. Here are two key quotes that are now about a decade old. So this was a recognized problem even a decade ago. Uh, Bob Pendyke, who was mentioned earlier, um, I, I would say he's the most vocally critical here. The damage functions used in most IAMs, integrated assessment models, are completely made up with no theoretical or empirical foundation. I'd say that's a little mean. Uh, there were data beneath these, uh, but indeed, uh, they could use some updating. A uh, more recent paper a year later, the models should be revised more frequently to accommodate scientific developments. Uh, so Tama just gave you a whirlwind tour de force on many of the scientific developments. Um, developed in the, the Climate Impact Lab, Max gave you a, a summary of, uh, of the other group working on this, uh, Berkeley RFF group. Um, a lot of this is based on great microeconomic work uh, across sectors and an updating of that microeconomic work. So here I'm just showing you uh, screenshots of key microeconomic insights about how key outcomes that we care about in the economy respond to uh, changes in climate, and here uh, I'm focused on temperature. So we see agricultural productivity mirroring what uh, Tama showed you, labor supply, so those were both in uh, what Tama showed. Ergonomics here um, is sort of a weird word. In an office environment, we think about it as how comfortable is my office chair. Um, in the labor productivity literature, it, it literally refers to how productive am I as a laborer. It turns out uh, people have been running experiments for decades, putting people in hot rooms, 
uh, or colder rooms or the same room and cranking up the temperature and measuring their labor productivity. And what they find repeatedly is as you raise the temperature, and uh, specifically in these examples, as you raise the humidity as well, people's labor productivity goes down. And this is true on manual tasks. It's also true on cognit cognitively demanding tasks. So we see an important impact on labor productivity, which was mentioned uh, by the previous discussant. Uh, and finally, we see interesting and emerging impacts on cognition. So uh, multiple papers now see a very strong relationship, uh, or at least an observable relationship, between hotter temperatures uh, and uh, poorer performance on tests. And that's true, again, on the day of the test, or if you look at the temperature in the year before the test, either of those, when the temperature gets hotter, it tends to drive down test scores, uh, and the effect sizes are meaningful. So it looks like... Again, evidence that Tama showed the two uh, top plots, these bottom plots are suggesting additional impacts on labor productivity and potentially on uh, cognition. So these are important scientific developments. Um, so how do we use these sort of estimates to improve damage functions? Tama just gave an excellent presentation on one approach, which I will call the bottom-up approach. So this is as you saw, it's using very trusted, high-quality microdata from around the world or from as many regions or subregions as you can get. And it's using really careful and well-honed econometrics to identify, to causally identify, the relationship between a climate variable of interest uh, and that outcome. Uh, as Tamit showed, this is really sectorally focused, so you have to do this, you go sector by sector. Um, and so some challenges are you have to be able to measure all the sectors that you care about and you need to be able to integrate them in a sensible way. Uh, and I think Max and Tama were both very clear about um, how these are challenges. We, we don't have measurements for all the sectors we care about. We might not have causal impacts. We not, might not be able to measure them everywhere. And so some sectors are uh, necessarily left out for lack of data. Uh, and right now, we don't have a great way to integrate these, right? Uh, and the way uh, Tama and co. are doing it is they're simply adding up the estimates. Uh, their main approach is to add up the estimates across sectors, which I think is the sensible thing to do right now, absent sort of better ideas of how to do that. Um, and I think there are great opportunities, as Tama just mentioned, to integrate with uh, folks who are thinking about the spatial trade models uh, as a way to integrate these. So the bottom-up estimates uh, are excellent, data-driven, and as Tama just showed you, uh, really important and influential now uh, in setting the SEC uh, in the U.S. And, and, and globally. Okay, I'm going to do something different. Uh, instead of doing a microeconomic, uh, sort of a micro-founded bottom-up approach, we are going to look at impacts in aggregate data. I'm going to call this a top-down approach. So again, we are just going to study economic aggregates directly and here. By economic aggregates, I mean GDP. Let me say at the beginning, again, that GDP does not equal welfare, echoing Jim Stock. GDP is GDP, um, and I'm going to show you how changes in climate have affected GDP over the last 70 years, and again, try to project those forwards. Um, so why should you do this? What are benefits and costs of this approach? So one benefit is you might think that a lot of the adding up is done for you, right? So if sectors are impacted, those sectors uh, have an impact on the economy, so that will, um, that will uh, be relevant for some of TAMA's sectors, but not all of them, right? It will not be relevant for mortality. It might be relevant for time use, labor productivity, agriculture, right? Those are observed in GDP. Um, so if you think that there are impacts in those sectors, and those sectors interact in important ways in, in generating the economic aggregates that we see, then studying the aggregates directly is nice because a lot of that adding up is done for you. You don't have to take a stand on how to add up across sectors. That's nice. Um, and similarly, uh, many costs and benefits of adaptation. So again, if you think there's some sectoral reallocation, that is an important part of the adaptation process. Arguably, the aggregates are going to capture that in a way the sector-specific estimates uh, won't. Um, so I would say those are the benefits of doing the top-down approach. Uh, there's a clear... Uh, Lots of costs or, or lots of downsides of doing it this way. Uh, one clear one and very important one is you're going to miss stuff that's not in GDP. Again, GDP is not welfare. The mortality costs, as Tama showed, are quite large. The monetized uh, costs of those uh, larger still, uh, and that's basically not going to show up in GDP at all. Right. So let's keep that in mind uh, as I go through uh, these estimates. Okay, so again, we're going to take a top-down approach, uh, and this is uh, basically what it looks like when a microeconomist tries to do macro. Uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to use 
standard microeconometric panel approaches for identification in macro data. Many of you are macroeconomists, and so you can tell us how we're messing this up, and I really look forward to that. I'm going to show you two different ways uh, that we estimate that. One, the way we've been doing it for a while, and the other is the way that macro folks tell us to do it now, the local projections method. It turns out they give us something very similar, which is nice. Um, Okay, so again, what is the goal here? So I have GDP, a uh, time series of GDP, and really we're going to study growth in per capita GDP here, and we have data from most countries around the world, so 190 countries have data for at least some years in our data set. We're using the World Bank data here back to about 1960. So we have 60 years uh, of data from most countries around the world. This is annual data on GDP growth. Um, and I want to relate that to observed temperature, precipitation, uh, in those countries uh, in each year. Uh, and then I want to identify the effect of temperature and precipitation uh, on GDP growth. So what am I worried about there? I'm worried about all sorts of other things, right? Things that could be correlated with average differences in temperature across locations or trends in temperature and trends in GDP growth uh, across locations or within locations, right? So uh, I am going to estimate a regression that tries to account for both these spatial differences, these unit differences, and I'm going to take those out with a set of unit fixed effects. Uh, so this is the, the, the units here are uh, subscripted by I, uh, a set of year fixed effects, and then uh, pretty aggressively also try to control for local trends in either temperature or GDP. So we have country-specific trends. We can est them, estimate them non-linearly. But again, that's taking out any country-specific trending things. Um, so uh, GDP in Chile is uh, trending, and temperature in Chile is trending, perhaps differentially than in Argentina, and I want to uh, control for that. Again, just to make sure I'm not picking up spurious correlations in trends, right? So we're trying to strip out any of this offending variation and just leave uh, what we hope is then plausibly exogenous variation uh, in, in this case, temperature and precipitation. So temperature here is T, precip is P. Uh, I have a function for temperature here. We want to estimate this nonlinearly. I'm going to do this with some simple polynomials, which seem to fit the data pretty well. Um, so again, what does this do? It's, it's going to use within country variation over time after taking out these trends. So standard panel econometrics, if you've seen this before. Um, and by estimating this non-linearly, non we're going to do something very similar to what Tama showed. Uh, it allows the within country effect to vary as a function of average temperature. And you can see that just by taking derivatives, which I'll do in a moment. Um, but basically, it allows the effect, the marginal effect of temperature to, to depend on your level of temperature, right? So the effect can be different in hot countries uh, versus uh, cooler countries. Okay, so again, the data we have is, is uh, what I showed you there. We're using ERA, uh, temp and precip. It doesn't turn out to matter what climate data you use too much. Um, and we are not, we're cutting the data off in 2019. It's hard to know what to do with the COVID years, so we just dropped them. Uh, okay, uh, so I am going to run regression. So the regression I showed you is going to have uh, the change in log GDP per capita uh, on uh, the left-hand side is the dependent variable, um, so that's uh, growth. Um, but just putting growth on, as a dependent variable in the regression does not necessarily mean that you are measuring growth effects. The nicest paper on this, which I will just crib from directly, is the Dell jones olkin paper that I think really started this whole line of research about a decade and a half ago. Uh, and their insight was that to understand, even if when you're running a, a regression with growth on the left-hand side, to understand whether you're really getting growth effects, you need to run a distributed lag model. You need to look at estimates both in the year of the shock and in the years after the shock. You need to sum up those estimates. And if the sum is different than zero, then that's consistent with growth effects. If the sum is zero, or is not distinguishable from zero, then that's consistent with level effects. Here's a plot that tries to show that. So on the top is just the level of GDP per capita, what we would call a level effect of a shock. So here, imagine that you have a shock in year T. So GDP per capita is growing. In year T, you have a shock that lowers GDP per capita, and then it recovers, and you're back to your previous path before. We're going to call that a level effect. Um, distinguish that from a growth effect at red. Um, or there's multiple flavors of a growth effect, but the simplest story is uh, you grow more slowly. So for a growth effect, you grow more slowly in year T. 
In year T plus one, you return to your previous growth rate, but you've lost that wedge, right? You've lost the, it's the year of lost growth, so you don't return to your previous path, you return to your previous growth weight, but there's still a wedge in the, in the level of GDP. <clears throat> what does that look like now if in, in growth rates? So if the level story is right, what you see is a decline in the growth rate in year T, but then a recovery, uh, growth has to, to to speed up in the year afterwards to return you to your previous path, right? And so the idea is then is if you sum up the negative effect in T and the positive effect in T minus one, you get something close to zero, and we're gonna call that a level effect. The growth story, of course, uh, is the opposite. Uh, you grow more slowly in T, you return to your growth rate in the next year, and the sum of T and T plus one is still negative, right? And so looking at the difference in the sum of the distributed lags tells you or gives you a sense of whether or not you have growth effects or level effects. We wrote an earlier paper on this, um, and that used data through about 2010. Uh, and uh, through 2010, we were not statistically powered to really distinguish whether we had found growth effects or level effects. We heroically and maybe incorrectly treated them like growth effects. Um, with updated data, uh, we can now do so. I'll show you that in two slides. Okay. So, uh, as I said, we're going to estimate this temperature response nonlinearly. Here's the zero lag model. So, if I just regress growth in this year on temperature in this year, I'm showing you a bunch of robustness here. You basically all get the same thing. You can change the functional form, you can change the um, sort of time controls, or you can control more aggressively for region by year FE. You can uh, use different climate data, you all get roughly the same answer. So, uh, this thing is nonlinear. Uh, mentally take the derivative of this, right, the slope, and that gives you the marginal effect. I'm, I want you to do that because I'm, show you, I'm about to show you some marginal effect plots. So think about the slope. Um, so if you're a cold country, so Mongolia is out here, average temperature of about five degrees Celsius, quite cold on average. It's on the upward sloping part of this, and so there we would estimate that uh, warmer than average temperatures increase uh, GDP growth in Mongolia. Uh, Chile is, is almost, and the U.S., it turns out, is almost right at the peak of this thing, so we're on a pretty flat part of the function. Um, although if you warm either the U.S. or Chile up uh, by two or three degrees, you push it onto the downward sloping part. Uh, and then most of the tropics are out here on the hot part uh, of, the, of the function. Uh, and the slope here is about 1% per degree. So that means in a year that's 1C hotter than average, economies that are warm to begin with grow about one percentage point more slowly. So that's a large, uh, very large effect. Okay, so that's the zero lag model. Now I'm gonna show you what happens when we start adding lags, right? So adding temperature lags, and again, that is the machinery that is going to hopefully allow us to distinguish growth effects uh, from level effects. So I'm gonna take the derivative of this and then I'm gonna start adding lags. So here in the upper left is the derivative of the function I just showed you before. Uh, and then as we move through, I add one lag, I add three lag, I have to add up to five uh, lags. We've done this up to 10 lags and it looks about like the five lag, a bit noisier. Um, so what do we see here? Uh, what we see is that the function starts to move slowly down and a little bit to the left, right? So once you've added up to five lags of temperature, the, the, you still see positive marginal effects. So again, remember this is derivative, this is the marginal effect. You still see positive marginal effects for the coldest countries in our data set, but now it's, it's noisier and no longer statistically different than zero. This thing now crosses, uh, goes from positive effects to negative effects at about seven degrees Celsius, so much cooler than our zero lag model. Uh, and for most of the sample, it's uh, substantially negative and statistically different than zero. So uh, our 2015 paper, if you had the misfortune of looking at that, had confidence intervals that contained zero. These confidence intervals uh, are well below zero at this point. So, so at least by the Dell Jones and Elkin test for, for growth effects, uh, we find, I would say, for most of our sample, evidence of uh, growth effects. Okay, the other way we can do this um, is using this local projection method. It's now 20 years old, but it's, it's finally, uh, I would say seeping its way into this kind of work. Um, so this is this very nice paper and incredibly well-cited paper now from Jorda, 2005. Um, and, and basically this is pretty close to the distributed lag regression. So we can run this like a panel. 
Um, I'm going to do the nonlinearity slightly differently because it makes the projections a little bit easier to look at, but if you take the derivative, it's pretty similar. Um, so basically what you're doing is you're looking at changes in growth over longer periods, right? So you're differencing some baseline period and then some future period, J years in, in advance. You're a little constrained by data. I'm going to show you J out to about 10 years. Uh, and then what this is estimating, so you estimate it for every J, and you can plot out the impulse response function. Macro folks seem to like to control for a lag of the dependent variable, so I'm doing that. And tell me whether that's wrong. Jorda seems to do that. So I can control for multiple lags. It doesn't seem to matter. Uh, and then again, I'm estimating the impact, uh, the, the impulse response of a, of a shock, uh, a, a temperature shock in year T, uh, and I'm allowing that effect to differ as a function of your average temperature, which again, functionally is what that nonlinear function does uh, as well. And then including the same FE and time trends as before. Okay, here's what you get. These are the impulse response functions. Um, so year one after the shock out to year 10 after the shock. Um, and so this is the sort of, let's call it the medium term effect, the 10 year effect of a one year uh, temperature shock. Uh, the effect is larger for hotter countries to begin with than cooler countries, but consistent with the increasingly negative marginal effects that I showed you uh, in the panel regression approach, the, I'll call it the vanilla panel regression approach, in this local projections we see something pretty similar, right? So the cold places after a year, it looks like the marginal effects are positive and then the marginal effects get increasingly negative and that's more so for the hotter countries. The magnitudes here, I think, are pretty directly comparable to the accumulated distributed lag estimates I showed you before uh, and, and are pretty similar uh, in magnitude. If anything, they're more negative for the cooler countries, which matters for places like the U.S. and Chile, which again are on the cooler part of the distribution globally. Okay. Um, we can test these data uh, quickly to try to understand or evaluate some conventional wisdoms uh, in uh, that you hear a lot in economics that relate very closely to adaptation and might help inform a projection exercise that then takes these historical estimates and run the world forward. Let me show you two. Uh, so one, and, and you hear this a lot if you go to economic seminars, um, one is the idea that, that uh, income or wealth insulates you from the effects of climate. This is explicitly built into some of the integrated assessment models. So fund has an income elasticity of damages. Uh, Tama showed you evidence for mortality anyway, that, uh, that, there, that, that impacts do seem to go down as a function of income, so we have uh, micro evidence that, that this is true. Um, the other is just that we've become less sensitive to climate over time. This could be due, because, could be due to our incomes getting uh, higher. It could be just because we're more experienced with temperature fluctuations or hot temperatures. Maybe uh, now we have a lot more science on impacts. Um, so something like the Lucas critique, we're, we're changing our behavior now because we're aware of what might happen if we don't. Um, so just to show you we've been getting richer, this is the pop weighted global average income has gone up you know, by a factor of two or three over our sample, so we've gotten a lot wealthier. Uh, and the average temperature has gone up, uh, and this is readily observable. So uh, we can evaluate these in data. Um, so here I'm going to take again the distributed lag function I showed you before, but now I'm going to interact it with income much like uh, Tama showed you before. Uh, I'm interacting it continuously with income and then evaluating that function at different quantiles of the income distribution. Uh, and what you see here is at least notionally consistent with uh, wealthier countries. So, so the more green the uh, lines get, the wealthier the, the part of the sample is where we're evaluating the function. And so the, the darkest green would be at sort of US per capita income and the darkest red here or the steepest function would be at, uh, you know, this is sub-Saharan African sort of average income. Um, these are in PPP corrected incomes. Um, and what you see again is notionally consistent with the effects getting flatter uh, as you're wealthier, uh, but we are actually not powered to distinguish uh, between these statistically. So while the point estimates look different, uh, the data are too noisy to say whether the slopes are actually different between the low income and the highest income uh, groups And we tried to cut this a bunch of ways to increase power and, and weren't able to get anything that, that uh, suggested a strong statistically significant difference uh, as a function of income. So here I would say uh, the evidence is, is somewhat mixed. The other thing we can do is <clears throat> just look at changing sensitivity over time. This is maybe a simpler test. So what we do is carve our data up into, in this case, three periods. 
of two decades each and estimate that same function in each of those decade pairs and ask whether that function has changed over time. Again, if things were adapting, you would expect that to flatten out, uh, and we don't see that at all. Uh, perhaps you see it a little bit if you squint your eyes, so the blue here is the most recent 20 years, um, but we really don't see much evidence that this response function uh, has changed over time. Okay, so again on wealth, I would say no strong evidence, um, maybe suggestive evidence in the point estimates that I showed you that wealth is a little bit insulating or income is a little bit insulating or something correlated with income. Again, so a lot of things are going to be correlated with income. In Tama's case, as in our case, it's hard to know whether it's actually income or something else, institutions, education, something else that's correlated with income that could be causing this heterogeneity. Uh, but in any case, uh, we, don't, we don't see a strong statistical signal that that's the case. And again, uh, no obvious change uh, in sensitivity over time. Okay, now we're going to take that uh, historical data, and we are going to, and I want to emphasize heroically, run the world forward. And so we are going to project the future evolution of GDP per capita in each country around the world. The way we're going to do this follows a lot of the machinery that Tama showed you. Um, but here we're actually, we're going to, again, be uh, projecting growth rates. So uh, your GDP per capita in one year is what it was last year times how quickly you grew. We're going to split the growth rate into a couple components. One is the secular growth rate, so how quickly uh, we estimate, or others, Jim Stock, it turns out, estimates you have grown absent climate change. Uh, and then our estimate of how much climate is going to increase or decrease uh, that growth rate as a function of your observed temperature uh, in that year. And we're going to get that delta from the response function that I showed you before. And we can use the zero lag. That turns out to be much more conservative than the five lag, again, which had much more negative marginal effects. So everything I'm going to show you here is just with that zero lag. Um, the temperature changes, this is a lot like follows Tama. Um, we're going to use the climate models to get the temperature change. And then for the growth rates, we can use Jim's restat uh, estimates or the SSP estimates, uh, and I can show you both. Um, so we can uh, estimate country-specific damages. We can estimate global damages. We can also estimate a social cost of carbon. Um, Jim says we don't need to do this. I'm going to show it to you anyway. Um, OK, there's lots of things you might worry about with this exercise. Uh, happy to dwell on these, uh, and I, uh, hopefully people will want to chat about them. One that comes up a lot is so this G function, again, is just what tells us how to translate temperature into growth impacts, is what I showed you before. Um, you might think that this is a short-run response function and that the long-run response function might look different. Um, this is a bit of a squishy idea, uh, but you hear it a lot. It, it has the whiff of truthiness to it. Um, so what's our response here? Do people respond differently to long-run changes in temperature versus short-run? How do you even know if a given temperature change is a short-run change or a long-run change in a year? You don't. So do you know what you're responding to? So all we can say on this is we don't see evidence that response, responses change over time uh, or that they differ much across space. Again, caveat the sort of noisy income results, right? We don't see strong evidence of heterogeneity. The only real source of heterogeneity is what is your average temperature, right? That's our main determinant of heterogeneity. If you're cool to start with, you seem to benefit. Again, consistent with all the microevidence. If you're hot to start with, you seem to be harmed. Um, so again, we're allowing, just as Tama did, these short-run response functions to vary as a function of the key source of heterogeneity that we see, which is average temperature. Okay, uh, and the other one that I, I would love folks' feedback on uh, is this one that has come up multiple times. So how do we think of um, sectors interacting, or in our case, countries interacting? So I argued that an advantage of our approach over, say, the bottom-up approach is that you get sectoral interaction, right? The economy does some of that adding up for you. But we're still treating Chile as completely independent of Argentina, right? We, we're not letting them interact in any way. And so you might be worried that those interactions are important and they're not going to be captured in any exercise we have here. Um, the one thing I would say here in our defense, and this is not a full-throated defense, it's not a great defense, is that if, so we've looked at this very carefully, it turns out that temperature shocks are highly correlated among trading partners. So Chile trades a lot with Argentina, and if it's hot in Chile, on average, it's also on average hot in Argentina, right? U.S. trades a lot with Canada, and similarly, the, those shocks are highly covariate. And at, so long as you think the pattern of covariance is going to continue into the future, 
I think it's the case that our reduced form estimate of this response actually then implicitly captures some of the spillovers uh, that we're worried about. If that covariance changes a lot in the future, trading patterns change a lot, uh, then that will not be true. But I think to some extent, some of what we care about about these spillovers is actually baked into our historical estimates. Okay, um, you all know what the social cost of carbon is. Uh, Tam gave a great explanation. There's the uh, math. Um, so th you, you have many researcher degrees of freedom here in how you want to calculate the uh, social cost of carbon, the discount rate, so this is the delta, how far out you're willing to run the world. So Tama showed 2,300. That feels just remarkably audacious to me that we have any sense of what the world in 2,300 is going to look like. So I'm actually going to cut the world off in 2,100. I don't want to project growth rates out past 2,100. It seems uh, hard. Um, you have to take a stand on the secular growth rate. Uh, we're going to take Jim Stock's stand, um, so blame Jim. Uh, and then, the, again, the regression model, we sort of have to choose what, what form of the regression model. I'm going to pick the most conservative one, which is the zero lag model I showed you before. If we run it with the five lag model, we get much bigger effects. Um, OK, for, for the uh, discount rate, we're going to use Ramsey. Um, Ramsey actually undoes a lot of the choices about the secular growth rate. So. Uh, because again, it endogenizes the, the discount rate as a function of how fast you're growing. So if you assume Jim's growth rates, you grow faster, but the discounting is faster. If you use SSP, you grow more slowly, but then the discounting is lower, so it, it sort of uh, cancels out. Um, okay, so under the most conservative assumptions, we can get an SEC of this approach uh, of $275, which is in the ballpark, a little higher than what uh, Tama showed and what Max showed uh, from the Berkeley RFF crew. Uh, but again, this is under basically our most conservative set of assumptions. Um, here's a, I can send this if anyone's really bored or having trouble sleeping. Uh, so we can make our assumptions less uh, conservative. So here's no impacts past 2100. This is the number I just showed you uh, using Ramsey discounting. If we allow impacts to go out to 2300, uh, we get estimates that are about an order of magnitude larger, right? So if you imagine, if you heroically assume that these growth rates continue for centuries, right, you get really, really big effects uh, centuries out. And even when you discount, these are pretty large, right? So again, yeah, I'm pretty uncomfortable personally with some of these. And so I, I, I sort of prefer to cut things out uh, in nearer term. Here, we are, again, assuming growth rates uh, based on, uh, or, or growth effects based on the evidence that I showed you. OK, so the SEC is one thing we can do. A second thing we can do is estimate a global damage function. So this is now going country by country, adding up damages, computing damages as a percent of GDP. Uh, and we can do that under, uh, so we only run this out to three degrees Celsius. We assume this is our sort of business is our worst case right now, which is also maybe heroic. Um, and so you can compare a sort of SSP3 7.0. This is our, if in the IPCC parlance, uh, that's our sort of uh, representative concentration pathway that we're closest to right now, and compare that to something that keeps warming to about 1.5 or 2 degrees Celsius. Um, and that's about a 10% difference in, in global uh, GDP through 2100. That's our estimate. Uh, and so again, this is about uh, 5x larger than what we saw in the IAMs. This is actually smaller than what we, somewhat smaller than what we published in the paper uh, eight to 10 years ago. Um, if you want it in dollars, you can also calculate it in dollars. So again, the difference between a three degree world and about a two degree world is something like $160 trillion discounted. Uh, I think this is using a fixed discount rate, so 2% discount rate. Um, so that to me seems like a large number. It's a lot of trillions. Um, and uh, because we're doing this country by country, you can also put the impacts on a map. So here's the benefits of limiting warming to 1.5C, Max pointed out that we're going to blow past 1.5C, so maybe this is not a reasonable exercise. I think he's right. Um, so maybe we should do two versus three by 2100. Um, so uh, you might have trouble seeing the color on Chile here. Uh, I made sure to look up the number on Chile. It's about a three to four percent impact on Chile and GDP by 2100, so loss. So, so uh, Chile is in the blue here, or, or uh, here this is, the sign is flipped. This is the benefits of keeping warming to 1.5 relative to 3. So uh, uh, the Chilean economy is 4% higher under 1.5 versus uh, 3. So again, that might seem like a small effect, you tell me. Um, 
The reason it's smaller for Chile than other parts of the tropics, say again, is because where it, it's relatively cool, right? These are population weighted average temperatures. Santiago is nice and cool. Southern Chile is even colder, so it's a cold place. Okay, to wrap up in my last few seconds, um, what do we see? Uh, a nonlinear effect of temperature on, uh, I'll say, output historically. Um, to us, these look like growth effects. Uh, a couple different models, uh, I think, suggest uh, evidence consistent with growth effects. Uh, we do not see strong evidence of adaptation. Maybe uh, income is flattening the curve, but we don't have enough data right now to be able to distinguish reliably whether income is helping. Um, <clears throat> pretty substantial likelihood of losses under future climate change. So again, uh, even odds uh, of losses greater than 10% of global GDP uh, by 2100. And again, that's only under the 3C scenario. 4 or 5C push that up above 20%. Um, and uh, I think these damage estimates uh, and, and the most easily comparable numbers are to the IAMs or to the social cost of carbon. These are, again, larger than the estimates you just saw from TAMA and certainly larger than the integrated assessment um, models. Uh, and I want to emphasize that they do not have some of the impacts that TAMA showed, right? So I think these impacts and the mortality impacts are to a first order additive. I think they're picking up totally different things. Um, whether or not we should add them is a separate question, but. They're certainly picking up different things, and, and our numbers look pretty large relative to existing estimates uh, of the SEC. So I will stop there and, and really look forward to your feedback. Thanks.